Okay. So starting with liver today, uh, let's go over some of the functions because there are quite a few. Um, and once we understand the functions, the signs and symptoms of pathology will make tons more sense, I promise. So the first one on your guys' notes, I don't know what order yours goes in. What's the first one on that you guys got? Forms plasma proteins, albumin. Okay, we can, I think I have the same notes as you guys, but it's in a different order. But let's, so you guys got albumin, can you name some other ones? It makes, the liver creates albumin, it creates clotting factors, it creates fibrinogen. What are some other ones? We'll go more in depth. I just want to list them off. Converts ammonia. Yep. So urea. ammonia, ammonia to urea. What else? Vitamin, vitamin storage. storage. Yep, that's a big one. And which which vitamins? A, C, E, K, B12, and the excess iron that's uh, circulating. Can we know that the drug? I mean, the liver metabolizes drugs. That's like the one thing I feel like everybody knows um, about the about the liver and nursing. What else? Deals with estrogen and progesterone. Okay. There's another. Hopefully, big... you can expand on that a little bit more with the estrogen and progesterone, because I didn't really understand. We'll come. We'll come oh. back to that. Um. There's one other big one. Um. Is it the bile? cells? What'd you say, Tracy? The Cooper cells. Okay. Yeah. So there are cup. Kupfer, Kupfer, I'm not sure exactly how you say it. They, um, their macrophages are like, you know, white blood cells that like eat the foreign invaders. Those are just what they call them that they live in the liver. And the other big one, I think, Fred, you're saying it was the bile and bilirubin situation. So there's a lot of things that the liver does, right? So if, if we really understand them, it'll help so much. So let's start with um, kind of something we're probably a little bit familiar with. So we know that, um, you know, with the blood sugar, the pancreas is the one is the organ that's mostly responsible for regulating um, your blood sugar, right? So we have we know that the pancreas, because I'll talk about about the pancreas as well, since that also is going to be on your test. The pancreas has got the alpha cells and the beta cells, right? The alpha cells secrete glucagon, right? And the beta cells secrete what? What's the opposite? Yeah, yeah. insulin. So glucagon and insulin kind of work opposites, right? When your blood sugar is really high, your pancreas will secrete insulin to lower the blood sugar. When your insulin is, I mean, when your blood sugar is really low, your pancreas will secrete glucagon because it sounds like glucose is almost gone, right? Glucagon. And it will help to, it will, what the glucagon will do is it will go to the liver, right? So glucagon goes to the liver, which I kind of think of like as the pantry, right? Like where you store all your extra stuff. And so the glucagon will say, hey, liver, we need more sugar. So they will grab sugar that's stored in the liver and the stored sugar there is called glycogen, right? So when it's free floating in the bloodstream, it's glucose. When it's stored in the liver, it's called glycogen. Now, when the glycogen starts getting broken down to put into the, into the bloodstream to help raise your blood sugar, that's called glycogenolysis. Lysis means to break down and the glycogen is to break down the glycogen. So that's um, something we kind of maybe a little bit familiar with since we're so, we've talked about diabetes so many times in nursing. Any questions with that so far? No, okay. Um, now gluconeogenesis, that's different from glycogenolysis. All right, so let's say you're in a situation where you're out in the middle of the woods stranded and you haven't eaten right in a while. The first thing that your body will do is that the pancreas will secrete the glucagon. The glucagon will go to the, the liver and get the, whatever stored left over the glycogen, right? Once you've gone through all of that and you have no more, maybe it's been like two days now since you've eaten, you know, you're like starving and you're like in a survival mode, then your liver will be like, okay, we've used up all of our glucose stores. We need to get more, right? Because your brain can only function with, with glucose. Without glucose, your, your brain shuts down and goes into a coma. That's why oftentimes you'll hear about like diabetics going into a coma, diabetic coma, because their blood sugar drops so low that their brain can't function. So we obviously don't want that. So what will happen is if you've used up all of your storage, then gluconeogenesis is going to happen. And I love the word because it literally explains exactly what it is. It's glucose. Neo means new. And genesis is like to create. So it's to create new glucose. 
right, gluconeogenesis. So what the liver can do is it takes like amino acids or different um, other proteins or fatty acids and it can convert them into glucose. That just takes that's a, a much longer process and it doesn't usually do that unless you've already used up your glycogen stores. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? No. All right, the other thing um, that the liver makes is like you said, albumin, um, which is a very important protein like you'll hear a lot about um, clotting factors and fibrinogen. So you can imagine if you know the liver is um, diseased or not working properly that you would expect bleeding issues to be a problem, right? Because if you're not able to, if the liver isn't able to make clot, you know, clotting factors, then you're going to have more bleeding, right? And so you'll look at some of the diagnostics for liver things, and you'll notice that like the PT and the INR are like, are higher than normal. And if you don't, if you're like, okay, why is that? You'll remember, oh, right. One of the functions of the liver is that it creates clotting factors. And if it can't do that, then your PT is going to go up. You're going to have bleeding issues, bruising, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? And feel free to stop me and ask questions if uh, you want clarification on something. Um, okay, so the next one I have is, you guys mentioned, converts ammonia to urea. So this is a very important um, function that the liver does. Um, we know that the kidneys, you know, filter out waste products um, and excrete it in the urine, right? But the, the, the kidneys can't do that until the liver has made it into a, a form that the kidneys can excrete. So your, your body is constantly producing ammonia, all right? It happens in your, in your back, uh, the gut bacteria and like in your intestines when that bacteria is like, you know, breaking down food or doing whatever it is that gut bacteria do all day, they're producing ammonia, right? It's part of just like a byproduct of their, of of their metabolisms that they that they do. And it's not a problem because the ammonia just gets, you know, goes to the bloodstream and eventually gets to the liver and the liver converts that ammonia to urea, which then travels to the kidneys and then the kidneys can excrete it, right? Because ammonia is toxic to us. But like in low levels, it's fine. But it's just when the levels start getting higher and higher, it starts causing problems. Um, it's, you know, ammonia is used um, it has been used in like really like bad kind of like gas, cha gas chamber situations. So we know that it's like, it's toxic, right? So if your ammonia levels start increasing because the liver is not able to do its job and convert it to urea, you'll start seeing central nervous system defects because it's a toxin. It's going to travel to the brain and start making you crazy, right? So they'll have, I think they call it CPE or something. Um, Soros, uh, I forget the name of it, but something encephalopathy, um, where like you're you start kind of like losing CNS function when ammonia levels get too high. You guys with me so far? And when it gets really bad, you know, after encephal encephalopathy, you can eventually go into a coma and death if your ammonia levels just aren't regulated. So um, liver does a lot. Um, what else? So the ammonia would be high and so would the urea because the kidneys can't excrete it? Well, the urea probably is actually going to be low because your kidneys, your, your liver can't turn the ammonia into urea, right? So your ammonia levels are just going to be high okay. around with no way to be converted. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so like a, a, diagnostic, a diagnostic lab test, right, would be your bun, your BUN, your blood, urea, nitrogen right? So the bun is testing how much urea is in your bloodstream, right? So with liver issues, your bun will go up or down? Down. Down, right? Because the liver isn't converting the ammonia to urea. And you know, usually we think we see lab values go up and we're like, okay, why would the bun be going down? That doesn't make any sense. But that's why, because the liver mm -hmm. can't do it. Got that? Yes. All right, next one I have is fat metabolism. Um, let's see. So fat metabolism, um, fats are like super important to your body to do like lo lots of different functions. So like, for example, you need fat to store vitamins, you know, like the vitamins A, D, E, and K are, you know, they get stored in fat and they're fat soluble. So you can't absorb those vitamins out fat. 
Um, they're important for the cell membranes, you know, the lipid bilayer, remember that from AMP, the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. So you literally can't have cells without fats. Um, there's lipid soluble hormones. So, you know, without having some fats around, like you can't even have hormones work, different things like that. So fats are essential for different functions in the body. Um, and one beneficial thing about the liver is that it has the ability to turn different kinds of fats into another kind of fats. So like there's lots of different kinds of fats. Um, we don't need to get into all of that because that's not, you know, it, uh, you know, the, your level of nursing isn't like required to know like all the different types of fats and things, so which is, which is great. But, um, so what happens is, and you guys heard of fatty liver. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is related to that. So when someone is, um, a lot of it is due to lifestyle. So if someone is consuming mass amounts of, um, mass amounts of calories, whether it be protein or fat or carbs, it doesn't matter when they're consuming just an excess, um, your body is going to store those, um, as fat in the liver. So it's like, what do we do with all this extra carb protein? We don't know the body, the liver can convert it to something that can be stored, right? Because fats are really valuable, like we mentioned. The liver is really focused on survival, right? It's like, okay, you know, fats are really important for lots of different functions. And you never know when we're gonna be stranded out in the middle of the woods and have no food. So we're going to take all this ex excess caloric intake, store it as fat in the liver. And then when the body needs it, we'll release it out again. Okay, so normally this isn't a problem um, because like the, the, the hepatocytes, which are the, the cells of the liver can bring it in, store it and release it when it needs to. Now, the problem is that um, when someone's drinking alcohol, oh, sorry, my phone, Shh, turn it off. Um, the problem is, is that when someone is drinking alcohol, uh, the presence of alcohol surrounding the hepatocytes, the cells of the liver, um, what happens is that it doesn't, the alcohol does not prevent the liver from taking in those excess calories and storing it, but what it does prevent it from is being able to excrete it again. So it may, it causes it to like store it and hold it inside the liver cell, right? So something about alcohol and its chemical makeup prevents the hepatocyte from excreting that fat after they've stored it. So what happens is that the hepatocyte just keeps getting more and more filled with fat, right? and the, the liver starts growing or hepatomegaly, right? And then, the, you know, at some point it gets to the point where it's like, okay, this is a fatty liver um, and it gets enlarged and you can feel it, you know, like when you do like the palpation, you can, you know, it shouldn't come past your ribs, but if someone has hepatomegaly, you can start to feel it coming below the rib cage and you can feel that it's enlarged. Um, so I know that was a lot. Did, it, did, did I lose you guys or did that make sense? sense. Good. Yeah. So fat metabolism is really important. So the liver, it's usually a great thing that liver can do that. Um, and that's why like alcohol is one of the main leading causes of fatty liver. Um, not all the time. It's not, you know, it's not, you can't always assume that someone is an alcoholic and they'll tell you that, um, you know, just like the same thing, just like, just because someone has lung cancer, you can't assume that they have been a smoker, right? Because maybe they had I don't know, bone cancer and it metastasized to the lungs, right? So there's lots of different reasons. So just be careful not to like um, prejudge your patient um, if they, you know, have never smoked or drank or anything like that. Um, so that's how the fatty liver happens is that when the hepatocyte is unable to um, export that fat that it has stored for, for later. Okay, good so far. So we've talked about the three different things so far the glycogen, gluconeogenesis, ammonia to urea, fat metabolism. Um, I don't really think there's much to say about vitamin storage other than it stores the vitamins. Yay, we need the liver to do that. Um, it's nice also because it helps keep the, the levels kind of stable and consistent, even if you don't have a consistent intake of them. So it's able to kind of like ration your vitamins, be like, okay, we haven't had any vitamins in a while. We'll kind of like disperse them, you know, sparingly. So that's nice. Um, cause you know, I mean, I know I don't eat enough fruits and vegetables every day, so there's that. Um, okay. So the next one, drug metabolism, and they talk more about this in like farm. You guys, have you guys taken farm yet? 
yeah. yeah. So we don't have we don't have to go very deep into that because that that's pretty much you know what they talk about drug metabolism and the kidneys and the liver, the whole class. So all they really need to know is that um, you know as the as you get older, your liver just loses ability to metabolize drugs over time because it just gets old. Um, the next one that we're going to talk about is the bile formation. So bile, um, let me ask you guys, what is bile? What's the purpose? Do you guys know? It breaks down fats. Perfect. So, you know, have you ever seen, like, if you try to mix oil and water, it doesn't mix, like the oil will just sit on top, right? So that's in the body, you have like the same problem. The, the fats don't really work well with the water. So they need to be emulsified, right? So bile is an emulsifier. It helps to break down the fats so that they can be absorbed and excreted, right? Because otherwise their lipid, you know, the, the fats are lipid soluble, not water soluble. So we need them to be water soluble so that they can be excreted, right? So bile is what helps to do that. Um, and how do we get bile, right? So the process, you know, I was looking at the notes and it was kind of like confusing. So I did some, you know, watched some videos and did some research to help break it down a little bit easier. So in your body, you've got red blood cells, right? And do you guys remember how long they live for, what their their lifespan is? Uh, 120 days. Yep, so 120 days. So you're constantly like, making new red blood cells and old ones are dying. It's just a constant process, right? And when red blood cells die, um, they release, they break up into their subgroups. You know, they got the heme and the globin, the hemoglobin, and those break down and whatever. So basically you get, when the red blood cells die, it produces unconjugated bilirubin. You don't need to know all the, you know, individual step-by-step -step processes like, oh, the heme group breaks into this, into that, doesn't matter red blood cells die, it produces unconjugated bilirubin. They call it unconjugated just because it hasn't gotten to the liver yet, okay? So unconjugated bilirubin, um, you know, if you guys remember, um, are you guys taking peds right now? Yes. Have you guys talked about bilirubin with babies yet? No, but we did in OB. Oh, an OB, yeah. So you guys remember how like babies can be born and they're jaundice and they have, you know, it's the uncontrogated bilirubin and they have to be put under the light and all that stuff. So it's the same thing can happen, um, you know, here is if you have an excess buildup of unconjugated bilirubin, um, then you can start to get jaundice and looking yellow, just like those little babies, right? And so what happens is that unconjugated bilirubin um, is carried to the liver by albumin. Albumin is a carrier it's a carrier protein. And so since we know that the, the liver creates albumin, right? First problem we run into is if the liver isn't functioning is that it's not creating albumin so that the albumin can't carry the unconjugated bilirubin to the liver in the first place. You see what I'm saying? So that's problem number one is that, you know, albumin is, is often used as a carrier protein to help carry one molecule to the next thing because sometimes they can't go by themselves they need someone to carry them so without albumin you have a problem it can't get there and then even if it did get there if the liver is like so far damaged it's not able to do its job it won't be able to convert the unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin right so conjugated bilirubin is fine you know it's just the unconjugated that causes the jaundice right the uncon the now that the liver has conjugated it that conjugated bilirubin is now able to be excreted because now it's water soluble not lipid soluble does that make sense nods all around before it was conjugated it was lipid soluble and needed to be carried by albumin now that it's been conjugated it's water soluble and is able to be excreted that makes sense red do you have a question No, okay. You <laughs> looked like you were about to pause your or push on mute. Okay. Um, so now that um, it's been conjugated or whatever, um, it can exit the liver. The unconjugated bilirubin leaves the liver via the common bile duct. You guys, let me actually show you. I can show you a picture. I'm going to share my screen. I pulled up a good picture and let me know if you guys can see it. Okay. Give me a second. So, can you see this picture? Yes. Yes. So 
you can see the common bile duct, the green um, tube coming out of the, the liver up on the top. So when the bilirubin gets conjugated, it's able to now come down the common bile duct and go into the intestine. So the intestine on the bottom specifically is the duodenum, which is just the very beginning of the intestine that comes off of the, the stomach, right? And I like this picture because it also shows the pancreas as well. So I know you guys are learning about pancreas too. So you can see the pancreas, the yellow thing on the right, and you can see the pancreatic duct right there. It's maybe a little bit hard to see. It's also yellow. And you can see um, that they come together. The pancreatic duct meets the common bile duct and informs one um, like exit into the duodenum. Do you guys see that? So one of the things you probably learned about, hopefully, um, with pancreas is that pancreatitis can sometimes be call, caused by gall, gallbladder stones, right? I have another picture I can show you of that, not that one. Maybe it's this one. Yeah. Can you guys see that? So here you can see here's the gallbladder. And if the stones come down the common bile duct and get lodged right at the opening by the um, duodenum, now all the pancreatic enzymes that are used to break down the fats, the proteins, like the amylase, the lipase, and the trypsin um, get stuck, right? They can't exit the pancreatic duct and go into the duodenum to go digest that food. They get locked up in the pancreas, and that's when the pancreas starts literally digesting itself because the enzymes have nowhere to go. Does that make sense? The other problem would be if this is blocked, then bile wouldn't be able to come down from the liver out into the, the intestines either. So gallstones are can be a serious problem because it's not just bad for the gallbladder, but it's bad for the pancreas and the liver. So does that, that picture kind of help? I like this one because it kind of shows all of it. So this is the liver up here, uh, the bile duct coming down here. And you can see how the gallbladder, the liver, and the pancreas all share like the same duct. So if it gets clogged somewhere, they're all going to be affected. Does that make sense? All right, stop sharing. I like to see pictures because it helps me kind of visualize like why it's happening. Um, if you guys, if that helps you. Okay, so yeah, so after the unconjugated bilirubin leaves the liver, it goes into the intestines and it's what causes your poop to have that brown, dark color, right? So the bilirubin is what gives your poop that color. So you can imagine if um, if um, the liver is damaged, right? And it's not able to conjugate that, that bilirubin. So it just remains unconjugated in your body. Not only are you gonna have jaundice, but what do you think your stools are gonna look like? Pale. Yeah, so they're gonna be pale because they're not gonna have that bilirubin to, to be able to color it. Does that make sense? Are the, the signs and symptoms kind of making more sense as you go over the functions? I hope so. Um, okay, so that's that's pretty much it for the, the bilirubin and the bile. Um, the, other, the other one I was gonna talk about is the Kupfer cells that, you know, Tracy, you mentioned. Really the Kupfer cells, they, um, they're just resident macrophages that live in the liver. So, I mean, you have white blood cells all throughout your body, but these guys just like to like hang out in the liver. Um, and what they do is that, you know, they do this, you know, what macrophages do. They ingest foreign substances. They help get rid of infectious agents. Um, but what's nice about it is that, um, so I don't know if you guys have uh, visualized, um, I think I have a picture. Well, let me show you. I don't know if you can see this little drawing that I made. Can you see this? Or is it too, is it too pale? I can see it. Okay, so you, can you see how there is um, like the hepatic artery that comes from the heart to the liver, which gives the liver blood supply, but then there's also the portal vein that goes from the intestines to the liver? Yes. So the, the portal vein actually is the major blood supply for the liver, which is surprising because you'd think it'd be the artery. But um, like this portal vein brings in blood from like all of your other internal organs. 
So whenever you're like, you're eating something, like maybe you get food poisoning or something like that, like whatever, maybe infectious agents are in your test intestines, like it's going to be able to signal up the portal vein to the Kupfer cells that are in the liver. And so the Kupfer cells are going to be like the first kind of responders to anything that's in the gut because they have like the quickest direct access from anything in the gut. Right. Does that make sense? So they have the first contact with everything that's been absorbed from the intent intestines via that portal vein. The Kupfer cells, what they also do besides just, you know, dealing with infectious agents and foreign substances is that they help with breaking down old and damaged red blood cells, um, which helps break, you know, break down the red blood cells to get that unconjugated bilirubin um, so to help them get recycled. So that's what they also help with. So those two things. Does that make sense? Oh, so said. those are the main functions. Um, do you guys feel like, yes, Tracy? Um, so you said that the portal vein is a major blood supply for the liver. Yeah, it is, and which, which was surprising to me when I, when I was researching that, because I was like, oh, I would have just assumed it would have been the artery. Um, but like a lot of, that's, we know how we talk about like the portal hypertension later, you know, and like, that's why, like, because it's like, it's such a major, um, blood supply source that like that is the one that gets the problem when the liver gets backed up. Any other questions about that? No. Um, Red, you said something about the estrogen. Can you read? Can you read that from your notes? Because um, in my notes, there's like no mention at all of estrogen um, in progesterone. It literally just says hormone homeostasis and the two hormones that she talked about were um, estrogen and progesterone. Okay, let me make a note of that and I'm going to look it up and get back to you because I don't know. That's not in the notes that I have. She said that estrogen would be high and progesterone would be low as well, but I don't know why either. Okay, I'll look into it and um, find an answer for you guys because I, I don't, I want to know the answer too. Okay. okay, and if I forget, send me a text. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to, um, do you guys want to start with like the different hepatitises or would you rather just go into like diagnostic tests, cirrhosis, that sort of stuff? I think it would be a good idea to start with the diagnostics because some of these we haven't been exposed to very much, like the, the liver function test. Yeah, um, and, yeah, and that'll make sense because we just talked about the functions anyway. Okay, so the diagnostic tests, um, you've got the ALT and the, S and the AST, right? Is this the first time you guys have heard about this or have you heard about it before in the nursing program? Um, barely. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So um, the AST and the ALT, what this is, is they are stored in the hepatocytes, you know, like the hepatocytes are the cells of the liver, right? Just what you call the, the cells that make up the liver and it's stored inside of them. Now the AST and the ALT will get released from the hepatocytes when those cells die. So you don't want to see AST and ALT in the bloodstream because that means that in order for it to be there, that a, a liver cell had to die. Does that make sense? So, um, with the AST and the ALT, um, if you see it, it's elevated, um, that's only going to tell you that there's been a recent injury, right? So typically, you know, like if there's a, like if I'm having a liver issue right now um, and some, some of my liver cells are actively dying, I might get a blood test and come back with an elevated AST, ALT. But if this has been going on for a while, um, it's probably not going to be elevated um, because that would be, it'd be more of a chronic thing and it's not it's indicative of a recent injury. So like, as soon as that damage happens, the AST, LT, ALT goes up, right? It doesn't remain up indefinitely. Does that make sense? So the other thing about them um, is that like, if someone, if you know someone has a liver issue, well, let's say, okay, their AST and ALT starts to go down. Well, this could be good or it could be bad, right? So I try to explain it like, think of AST and ALT like, um, like it's smoke, right? So let's say your, um, your house is on fire, right? And, you know, all the smoke is there, obviously. Now, if suddenly the smoke stops, 
that could mean one of two things. It could mean that someone successfully put out the fire, right? So the smoke would have stopped as well. Or it could mean that the fire has burned up the whole house and has nothing left to burn. So there's no more smoke. Does that make sense? So with the AST and the ALT, it's kind of the same thing. Um, with the hepatocytes, it's like the AST and ALT only are there when, when liver cells are dying. So if the AST and ALT are going down suddenly, it could mean that, yay, the injury has been fixed and the liver is healthy because we fixed the problem. Or it could mean that like there's no more cells to die and it's just really got, gotten really bad. <laughs> so does that, make, does that make sense? Um, the other thing is that AST and ALT levels um, don't say anything about like how functional the liver is. So don't assume that like, oh, because the AST and ALT levels are high, that means the liver doesn't work. That's not necessarily the case because it could be injured but still maintain function if it's dealt with fast enough. You know, kind of like with your heart and someone's like having a heart attack and they're releasing troponins, right? Like if you intervene and save that heart muscle, like it can still regain it, it can still fix itself and regain its function, right? So, so troponins don't necessarily mean that your heart is dead, just like the AST and ALT doesn't mean that the liver is dead. Does that kind of help explain a little bit? So in class, we learned that the ALT is specific to liver function, yeah. while the AST is more of what just like shows injury. Yeah. So the interesting thing about the body is whenever there's muscle damage, there's going to be things like troponins. There's going to be things like, uh, what are the other ones? Um, myoglobin, I think. Um, various mm -hmm. things get released when there's, when there's muscle damage. Right, but certain ones are like highly specific to an individual organ. So ALT, I just it's easy to remember because it has the L in there for liver. Um, just like troponins are specific to heart muscle, right? If you saw troponins, you wouldn't think, oh, well, this is it could be any muscle. So we don't know. It's like, no, it's specifically the heart muscle, right? And I, I can't remember, I think it was myoglobin, don't quote me on that, but like I think myoglobin is another one that they test, but it's kind of just generic muscle. It could be from like you worked out too hard and you're like you've broken down a lot of your muscle and you have lactic acid. So they test both for the liver, but um ALT is the one that's like highly specific to the liver. Okay. That's pretty much it. Um yeah, so they will, the ALT and AST levels will go up in, a, in recent or acute uh, liver injury, but not so much with chronic, okay? Now, albumin, um, we know that albumin is made by the liver, right? So in liver disease of any kind, do you expect albumin to go up or down? Down. Right, because it's not being able to make it, right? Um, now this one, like, will sometimes take a little bit of time to show up. So if you're having an acute episode of the liver, you probably won't see low albumin levels. And the reason being is because albumin has a long half-life. I think it's something like 20 days. So like, even if your, your liver isn't able to make any, your albumin levels will stay pretty constant in your bloodstream for a while. So once it starts reaching like past that 20 days when most of it starts to die off, then you'll start noticing that your albumin levels are starting to drop. Does that make sense? So this is not, when you see lower albumin levels, that doesn't usually indicate an acute uh, flare up of the, of the liver. It usually is significant I mean, or indicative of a chronic problem because it has to have been enduring for at least 20 days, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. The other one I've got is, um, you know, the ammonia. What do we expect that to do? To go up. Right. To go up because it's not being converted to what? Urea. Right. Um, now we got the PT, which is the prothrombin time. This has to do with clotting. Now that we know that the liver um, produces or creates fibrinogen and other clotting factors, right? So if it's unable to produce those, what do we expect the value to go up or up or down? Right, so an increased prothrombin time means that you're taking longer to clot, right? So you're gonna have bleeding issues. 
So be, with these patients, you know, like patient care interventions, you know, you would consider this person like as if they were on blood thinners, you know, like being careful that they, you know, don't take any falls or like cut themselves shaving because they're having <laughs> issues with, with clotting. Um, same thing with the platelet count. Both of those are going to be the same. Um, bun, we kind of talked about this already, but bun is your blood urea nitrogen. Uh, and this measures how amount, the amount of urea that's in your bloodstream. So will this go up or down in liver disease? Down. Down. Because why? The liver is not able to convert it. Right. So you just got ammonia and no urea, which is bad because it causes what in your body? Encephalopathy. Encephalopathy. Also, I think they mentioned puritis. Um, well, that's not necessarily from the ammonia. Ammonia and the bilirubin, like, like elevated in your body is going to make you super itchy. So they talk about like the patients that are like just constantly scratching and you want to keep their nails short so they're not like, you know, scratching themselves and like, you know, excoriating their skin. So all those toxins in the body is going to make you crazy and super itchy. Not a fun time. Um, going back a little bit to the platelets, um, you know, obviously you're going to take longer to clot, but your plate, the PT is going to go up, but your platelet is going to go down, but it, it's the same thing, right? Because the platelets are what help clot, but you're just going to have less platelets, right? So I don't want you to get confused with the, with the platelets going down and the PT going up. They're measuring the same thing, but just in a different way. Does that make sense? Yes. So the reason, if you want to go a little bit more in depth with the platelets, um, the reason being is that you have your spleen, and I know we don't really talk about spleens hardly at all either, um, but with the spleen, um, one of the things that the spleen does is that it stores platelets, right? So like, obviously you don't want tons and tons of platelets just floating around in your bloodstream all the time because like they could get clogged and cause DVTs and whatever. So they're stored in the, in the spleen for when you need them. Like if I start massively hemorrhaging, you know, because I have a huge gash or something, your spleen's gonna be like, here's the platelets, right? But you don't need them like just chilling in your bloodstream all the time, right? So the problem is, is when you have liver issues and we'll talk about some of, the, some of this stuff in a little bit, but like I mentioned before the portal hypertension, right? So and we'll talk about that in a minute, but like one of the problems with portal hypertension is that, you know, just like with when you have renal hypertension, the blood flow through the liver is compromised, right? It's not getting perfused and the blood isn't able to go through it like it normally should. So it starts backing up. Just same thing like with your heart, same thing with your kidneys, that if it can't go through, it's going to start backing up. So all that fluid is going to start backing up. And one of the places that the fluid backs up into is the spleen, right? Okay, so as the fluid you know, is stuck in the liver, it's going to back up into the spleen, which is going to make the spleen grow, right? So now you've got splenomegaly. And as the spleen gets bigger, there's more space inside. So it's able to store more platelets, right? So the amount of platelets that are would be in your bloodstream are now being stored extra in the spleen, all right? So that means that there's less circulating in your bloodstream. So your platelet count when you do like a blood test is going to look lower also. Does that make sense? It's like, you know, if you have a, a small pantry and that's where you store stuff, but then you make the pantry bigger, you can put a lot more in there. It's kind of like the spleen, like the spleen gets bigger so they can store more platelets in there, which means you'll just have less circulating in your bloodstream. So it'll look like you have low platelets. Does that make sense or is that confusing? But during times of in injury, sorry, um, will the spleen still release those platelets? Yeah, it's just, you know, just when you're just normal, like right now, you know, like hopefully you're not hemorrhaging or injured, but like it's going to just look like you have less circulating in your bloodstream, but they're still going to be there. They're just going to be stored. So, yeah. But they're storing extra. The spleen is storing extra. Right, because it's bigger now. So is that a risk for bleeding a DVT? Because if it released a whole bunch at one time, no, it would kind of gather. It would still release what you need, you know. Like it's not going to just dump everything out all at once. Just so it doesn't create a clotting problem. No, with these patients, you have 
you have the opposite problem is that you don't have enough clotting factors. You don't have the platelet circulating, so you're at risk for bleeding. Okay. I was just trying to, in my mind, think and make sure that we weren't in like a DIC situation where you're <laughs> bleeding, but you're clotting. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, did you have a question? Oh yeah. So for the low platelet, is it for acute and chronic? Um, it would, it would just be whether or not there's splenomegaly. Right. And generally splenomegaly isn't going to happen overnight. That's going to be typically from like years of abuse, right? Like portal hypertension doesn't happen overnight. Right. So that's something that's more of a chronic liver problem, you know? Um, so that's going to take time to build up. So I would say that that'd be a chronic problem. Any other questions about that? Was there any other diagnostic tests that I missed or didn't explain? Did I get them all? The bilirubin? Oh yeah, the bilirubin, um, well, it depends. Is it the conjugated or the uncon the conjugated or unconjugated, right? So those are two different types of bilirubin. So is your unconjugated gonna be higher or is your conjugated gonna be higher? She told us not to focus on that quite yet. Okay, well, I mean, it's it but, should be, you know, pretty in intuitive. Un that the it's the unconjugated. Un yeah. Yeah, so like, especially if they have cirrhosis or something, like the un unconjugated is going to be a lot higher because the liver can't, can't do it, right? Okay, so moving on from that, what do you guys want to go to next? Do you want to do the hepatitises? or cirrhosis, portal, portal hypertension, you choose. Can we start with the hepatitis? Sure. All right, so hepatitis, viral or bacterial? They're all viral. <laughs> yeah, that was just, throw a question out there. So they're all viral, um, which means you can't take like antibiotics for it, obviously. So you have to get like special, special drugs. They do have, some of them have vaccines, some of them don't. Um, so basically what hepatitis is, is that itis means inflammation and specifically inflammation of the hepatocyte itself. So as they start to inflame, they start to get bigger, which can lead to like the enlargement of the liver, right? So enlargement of the liver can be from the fatty liver, remember as it's getting bigger and full of fat, or it can be from inf inflammation due to like a hepatitis. Does that make sense? So if you find, if you're doing an inspection on a patient and you palpate an enlarged liver, you've got to do some research and further testing to figure out why, like what's causing it, okay? Um, viral um, is the, is the, most common reason, um, and we're going to talk about the A, B, C, what is it, D and E. So hepatitis A, um, this one, this one does not have any sort of chronic form. Um, so there, you'll, it's, mo it's just an acute situation. I think of A for acute, right, no chronic. The other thing I think of for A is it's a fecal oral route. So a start, you know, sounds like a word that rhymes with class that starts with an A, right? <laughs> and also you can think A for anus as well, fecal oral, right? So it comes from the intestines, someone's, especially like little, you know, kids are constantly getting fecal oral things, you know, they're playing in their, their private parts and touching their mouth. The kids are just all up and everything. So um, I think of A for anus, a for acute to try to help me remember the difference because there's like five different types and it's like, uh, how am I going to remember all of them? Um, so that's the transmission. Um, I mean, there is a vaccine for it. You can get it, the HAV, hepatitis A vaccine. Um, and I think it would be good for you guys to know if, with the difference between these, which ones have vaccines, which ones have like immune globulins that you can get which ones you can't. Um, and then the other differentiation I would like know is like what the different transmission is. So whether there's a vaccine, the different transmission um, and what the, 
like I'm pretty sure I remember when I was in, in that class like they would ask like oh someone has positive IgM do they have a current infection or a past infection type of thing so those are the kind of things we're going to look at okay so that's pretty much it for type A um knowing that there's a fecal oral that there's a vaccine and there's immune globulin and that's pretty much that um it get, oh and it's get you can kill it with chlorine bleach so that's one of the reasons like in the hospital they bleach everything right um hepatitis b um this one is transmitted via blood body fluids a lot of b's here so that's how i remember b for b for blood b for body body fluids um labor i think of birth which is another b birth body fluids blood um and blood transfusions um back in the past bef before 1992 so those are pretty much all b's right blood body fluids birth and blood transfusions so i think b for all of those things um what else there is an immunization you can get for it um there is an immune goblin gob globule go, i always want to say goblin and that's not the right word it is not a goblin globulin <laughs> um let's see what else about this one any question any was there anything really that stood out to you about either a or b that i didn't touch on that didn't make sense no I mean, they're pretty, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's not hard to understand. It's just memorizing, unfortunately. And that's why I try to like make these little memory helpers. Um, okay, hepatitis C. This one is transmitted blood to blood, right? So this one, maybe you might get confused with hepatitis B because that's also passed in blood, right? But hepatitis C isn't transmitted all the other ways that hepatitis B is, right? So you're not going to get it from body fluids. It has to be specifically blood to blood. Um, and the biggest, what is the highest incidence of transmission for hepatitis C? IV drug use. Right. So I know that crack cocaine isn't IV, but it's a drug, right? So I think hepatitis C, crack cocaine, because it's, you know, C and a C, and that helps me remember, okay, this is the one that's spread via drugs, right? I know you don't inject cocaine powder into your, into your veins but you know it just it's just a memory thing um also tattoos you know getting sharing if you have contaminated needles because you know it's going in from someone else's blood into yours uh, so that's another possible way um what else there with hepatitis c there is no vaccine or immunoglobulin um and it's very common um most of the time when you go into the hospital once they have hepatitis it's usually c so especially if you've got someone there who has a history of drug use, it's most definitely going to be C. Um, any questions about that? Um, oh, the other thing, there is, um, there is a cure for this one now. Um, it tends to be chronic in nature, but they do have cure. I don't remember what the cure is because I once looked it up, but I don't have it written down in my notes. Does anyone have anything on that? No, I just have antivirus. Yeah, so you know things that end in veer, like oseltamivir or remdesivir or whatever they are. Um, okay, so hepatitis D. Um, I have that it's typically from dogs. Is that what you guys have too? Mm. Animal bites. No. What do you guys have? co-infection or super infection with having hepatitis b so you need to have hepatitis b to get d yeah i have that too i also just have written down in the margins that like animal bites specifically dogs um like you have to get the hepatitis d from somewhere right but you can't get it unless you've had b first mm -hmm. right so hepatitis b will set you up to possibly get d but you have to get the d from somewhere right so I don't know if that's true or not, but I just had it written down. Um, if it is true, it's convenient because animal bites, dog, that starts with a D. So I don't know. Um, Grace. Yes. Um, according to the CDC, it says that you have to have hepatitis B with hepatitis C, which we know you just talked about that. Um, but it can be spread through blood or any bodily fluids of somebody who's infected with the virus. Okay. 
maybe I was thinking, that's, I don't know, maybe I, was, I think maybe it was just something that a teacher mentioned in passing. It was like saliva, like if someone, like if a, an infected animal bites you with their saliva, it would pass, it, it would pass it to you. Um, you said body fluid. It, it does say in our notes, hepatitis, bad dog, for us to remember that you had to have had a bad before you can have a dog, so you had to have had B before you can have B. Well, there you go. Whatever helps you remember. <laughs> <laughs> Just know that you can't, you can't get hepatitis D unless you've had B. Um, that's really the main thing. Um, and then if you do have hepatitis D that has a higher mortality rate, just because now you've had two types of hepatitis and two, two types of hepatitis are worse than one, obviously. Right. So how do you prevent yourself from getting hepatitis D? Well, don't get hepatitis B or get a vaccine for hepatitis B, right? Make sense? Um, hepatitis E, I have almost nothing about this one, just that it's waterborne and that it's similar to A. Do you guys have anything else on that one? No, just that it can be lethal in pregnant women and young children. And Honestly, the, pro the ones that she's going to probably ask about the most is hep C because that's the most common one that you'll see in the hospital and then you know the, um, the transmission of A and just you have to have B before D what really is the like the more challenging part is the specific tests you know for the hepatitis is being able to like kind of figure that part out so like the IgM and all that stuff so there's different tests for like different types so you like depending on whether you have A, B, C you have like different tests that you would do, right? So if you look down at hepatitis A, you'll see that there's like the IgM, anti-HAV antibodies, and there's the IgG, anti-HAV antibodies. You guys have that? Yes. Yeah, so when I first looked at this as a student, I was like, what in the world are all these letters? I have no idea. So basically what happens is, you know, like when you guys get an infection, like, um, let's say I have a cut right here and some either a virus or bacteria enters into my bloodstream, you know, you've got your immune system that's constantly like looking out for threats, right? So, you know, there's that, there's the, in the stages of sickness, like you have the, the incubation period where you're not really having any signs and symptoms yet. And you're, the virus or the bacteria is kind of growing and spreading and getting ready to like reach a point where you now you feel ill, feel ill, right? So, and during this time, like your body is going to be like trying to fight it and trying to keep it down. And then they're also working on creating antibodies that will help to get rid of them, right? So when you're first infected with hepatitis A, the IgM antibodies are going to be the ones that go up first. So this is like the first defense, right? And this is when you're having like, it's going to happen like shortly after being infected. So there's going to be like an acute, acute infection or a recent infection. So like you're actively still ill, right? And I like to think of M standing for like miserable, right? Because you're just feeling miserable because you're acutely sick. Does that make sense? Now with IgG antibodies, these um, are what develop once like your body turns the tide and is like been able to create enough antibodies that your body's winning now and fighting off the infection. So you'll have IgG antibodies once you've recovered and are no longer sick. And now that you have full immunity, does that make sense? Cause there's a, there's a, you're, there's like a, a period in time when you're not really immune yet because you're like still fighting off the acute infection and you haven't built up enough an antibodies yet because those those take time to be produced, right? So if, if a patient comes in and you do a blood test on them and they have they have positive IgG antibodies, you're gonna be like, okay, this person used to have was infected with this hepatitis, but they are, their body has fought it off and now they're immune to it. Okay. So I, how I remember is the M stands for miserable because you're acutely sick and the G stands for gone. Like the infection is gone. If that doesn't work for you, you can make up your own, but that's just something that I put in my brain. Um, so whatever, you know, helps any question about that, about that one. No. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Now the next one, 
um, hepatitis B, you've got the HB SAG and the HB SAB or, you know, SAB. So this one is similar, um, but just a little different. So do you guys remember from a &P when you learned about like bacteria, viruses, whatever, that like everything, whether it be your cell or someone else's cell or like a bacteria, they all have what's called antigens. You remember that? So like, if you have like this, you know, my hands making a cell right here, like your own cells will have certain markers, certain antigens to like say, hey, this is me, you know, this is Grace, right? So like, if I get a blood transfusion, like someone else's blood, even though we both have red blood cells, like they're going to have different markers than mine. And that's why like they have to be the same or else there's going to be like your immune system will attack it thinking it's a foreign invader, right? So those antigens are kind of like team jerseys that identify what team you're on, right? So like, let's say all my antigens are blue, right? Because I'm wearing a blue shirt, right? And CETA, maybe yours are all red. So they wouldn't match and they would attack, right? So with the hepatitis B, what... um the blood test is looking for is hepatitis B surface antigens, right? So the hepatitis B virus itself will have certain antigens that identify themselves as hepatitis B virus, right? So, and those will be detectable in a blood test. So you're taking someone's blood and you're like, hey, we've detected hepatitis B surface antigens, which means that they have the hepatitis virus in their bloodstream right now, which means that they are having an infection, right? So if they, if you keep testing their blood and they keep having the surface antigen for longer than six months, then now it's a chronic infection, a chronic carrier. Does that make sense? Because hopefully your body would have been able to fight it off or like you could have gotten, you know, healed by then, but if not, now you're a chronic carrier if you've had this surface antigen repeatedly in your bloodstream for more than six months. Is that clear so far? Okay, so the next one is the HBSAB or hepatitis B surface antibody, right? And the antibodies are what the body makes to take care of and attack the antigens. So after your body has like had a time to be like, okay, we need to create a specific type of antibody that will latch on to the specific type of antigen on the hepatitis B virus. Now that indicates immunity, right? Because those antibodies are able to latch onto those antigens and have them, you know, get, get eaten by those macrophages and phagocytes, right? So if you're getting a blood test on a patient and they have positive HB surface antigens, that just means they have an infection. And if they've had it longer than six months, it's a, they're chronic. But if you check their blood again, and now they have these hepatitis B surface antibodies, that means now they've got immunity. Does that make sense? Now, the, to throw a little wrench in that, there's also the HBCAB, okay, the hepatitis B core antibody, right? So the core antibody is different than the other one, the hepatitis B surface antibody, right? Just because you know that the hepatitis B, there's a vaccine, right? So you can get vaccinated against hepatitis B, which is actually recommended, you know, to avoid getting it and to avoid getting hepatitis D and so forth. A lot of like healthcare professionals will get vaccinated against hepatitis, right? So hepati what the vaccine does is it gives you artificial immunity right? Like you never actually had the disease, but they're just giving you antibodies in case, you know, you get infected with the hepatitis that you don't have to go through the process of, of creating antibodies. You're just, you already have them in your bloodstream because you got vaccinated. Does that make sense? So the difference between the hepatitis core antibody and hepatitis surface antibody is the core antibody specifically means that you developed immunity from having the disease, right? So the other one you'll have just from the vaccine, but the, the core one will tell you that like, hey, this person actually had an active infection of hepatitis B and their body created these core antibodies. Does that make sense? Thumbs up. Okay. 
So it's not, it's not too bad, I promise, once it gets explained. I was like looking at this when I was a student, I remember feeling like, oh my word, if I see five, if I, if I have to see one more H, B, S, L, Q, L, M, N, O, P, I'm going to die. You know, so once you kind of explain it, it kind of makes more sense. Um, now, the last one for hepatitis C um, is they do, and don't ask me to explain exactly what this is because I don't know. I don't do things in a lab, but they have something called an enzyme and immunoassay. Um, and what they're doing is just looking for, you know, if you have antibodies to this or what's going on. So if they, if you are getting tested for hepatitis C using this enzyme immunoassay and they find that you have an antibody to hepatitis C, then obviously that means that at some point you've had an hepatitis C infection, right? Either in the past or currently. Make sense? I mean, that's fair to assume like, oh, you have antibodies, you had to have been infected at some point, either currently or later. Um, the other thing they're gonna look at is a viral count. Um, so if someone, like let's say, Red, I do a blood test on you and I find antibodies to hepatitis C, all I know is that you've been infected. I don't know if it's right now or if it was in the past, right? Because these antibodies never go away, right? So it's not like they, go away when you're not sick anymore. You'll have them forever. So now I need to know like, okay, is she currently sick right now? Right? So if the, if you have a positive antibody, now I have to do a viral count. And the viral count will see if you have like how much of that virus you have in your body. Right? So if it's high, obviously you're currently infected. If you if it comes back zero, that means that you, the antibodies were just because you had the infection in the past and you don't have it currently. That makes sense. So, yeah. So typically, they'll just be like, okay, they'll t they'll they won't bother doing a viral count if your antibodies come back negative, right? Because there'd be no point. But if it does come back positive, they have to know if you've been infected, if you're infected right now, and that's what the viral count is. Any questions on those? Clear as mud. You good, Sita? Yes, I'm good. Okay. So you. typical test questions for this would be like, um, you know, a patient uh, has positive IgG uh, antibodies. Um, you know, what is your what is your treatment for this patient? And it just assumes that you know what that means. So you'd be like, oh, shoot. Does that mean that they're currently infected or they were, right? So you would have to know, okay, IgG means G for gone. So they had it, but now they're immune, right? So you're not worried about like treating an active infection. So that would help you answer like the questions about like what to do with this patient. Does that make sense? Another one might be like, um, I don't know, um, like a patient presents with four months of, positive hepatitis B surface antigen, you know, and then like, you'd have to know, does, is that chronic or is that acute, you know, and it's, it's under six months. So it's kind of, it doesn't meet that criteria. So just like knowing what they mean, um, cause they're not going to tell you in the test, right? You have to remember what it means in order to answer the question. So it's not too difficult. Um, so going back to the core antibody, mm -hmm. you just said, basically that means they developed immunity from having the disease. Yes, instead of being vaccinated. So okay, like and then, a lot of nurses get vaccinated against hepatitis. And so like if you did a blood test on them, they would have okay. hepatitis B surface antigen or surface antibody. And that would just mean, okay, they're immune because they were vaccinated, but they've never been infected. Okay. And then like the surface antibody, like underneath it, I have written immunity from natural infection or vaccination, which you, you spoke about. So, but they can get that from having it, but not being vaccinated as well. And that's another way they can get Sorry, it. Say that again. Um, so they can, they can get the service antibody from having it, but not being vaccinated. Well, would that be? Um, I'm going to, I'm not sure what that is saying, because in my notes, it was saying the core antibody is the one that you get from having the disease. Right. So I have. I have that too, like exposure to the virus and then presumptive infectious. Like we, we know that they are infectious at that time. 
And then for surface antibody, I have immunity from natural infection or vaccination, which right. would mean. Right. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the core antibody from a vaccine. You would have, yeah. the, you would have the other one from the vaccine. Okay. I got you now. Okay. Just want to clear that up. And if there's any, any discrepancy on that, you can ask your teacher for clarification because I don't want to tell you wrong. Um, of course. And then you'd be like, Grace said this. <laughs> um, okay. I think we're good on that. Um, are you guys doing good on time? Do you guys need to like leave any specific time? Um, I'm good for a little bit longer. Okay. I just don't want to like make you guys feel like I'm holding you forever. Um, let's go over. Do you want to do uh, cirrhosis or portal hypertension? We can start with cirrhosis. Okay. So cirrhosis basically is just chronic scarring and damage, right? So as your liver is being abused, whether it be from alcohol or whatever it is, fatty liver, and it's trying to heal itself, you know, like when something is constantly being injured and healing itself, it gets fibrotic, right? And scar tissue starts to build up, which means that the liver is not working the way it used to. Um, and so now you're going to have complications because the liver is really great at healing itself, but there comes a point where you've reached like the point of no return and you, it can't anymore. Um, so there's, you know, under the notes it says there's four different types of cirrhosis. There's the first one, which is uh, Lanix, Lanix does, type of cirrhosis, which is the from alcohol intake, right? And that's the number one cause in America, right? So the U.S., that is the number one reason why someone has cirrhosis. And that's why some medical professionals tend to assume that someone's an alcoholic if they come in with cirrhosis, but it's not always. Second type um, is called post necrotic, which this one is due to repeated or, or chronic uh, hepatitis, right? And this is the most common worldwide, especially like in third world countries where they don't have like the same you know, medical opportunities they do here. So like if someone has a hepatitis just like forever and it's untreated, the liver's gonna try and heal itself, right? And so it's gonna still do the same thing, build up scar tissue and damage from trying to heal itself over and over again. So you're gonna see that one more often. Um, that's the number one cause worldwide. Um, then there's number three, biliary cirrhosis. So you guys remember that picture I showed you of the bile ducts and everything? So if there's an obstruction, like I showed you, um, and like the bile isn't able to get out, it can cause damage to that liver because it's just getting blocked up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the last one is cardiac. So this one is, it's not actually your liver that's the problem, it's your heart. So your heart, you have CHF, which you guys will talk about way more in depth in a few weeks and when you get to the cardiac content. But CHF, basically your heart is a pump. And if the heart starts dying, it's not able to pump. So stuff starts to back up, right? If your heart isn't able to you know, push that, that fluid out fast enough, everything will start to back up. So the, ba the blood will back up into the liver, make it swollen, make it more tension and pressure, which will make the perfusion bad to the liver. And then it starts doing the same thing. It's get damaged and scarring and all that same, same, same situation. So those are like the four main causes of cirrhosis. Clear on those? That makes sense? Okay. So when we look at assessment findings for cirrhosis, all of these should make sense to you because you guys know the functions of the liver, right? So let's look at them. Obviously, abdominal pain, you know, that's not a surprise. Um, fatigue, I mean, fatigue is a sign, symptom of everything. The puritis, the puritis is the itchiness. And remember what we said that was from? From the bile on their skin? Yeah, so the, that, that buildup of bilirubin that isn't able to get conjugated, right? So you'll start getting jaundice and that bilirubin will make you super itchy. Um, some other ones, complications. Um, some complications are like the portal hypertension. So I showed you that like that portal vein, remember that was leading to the liver. Um, when the liver is super scarred and like fibrotic, it's not nice and like elastic and soft like it used to be, 
so like the the fluid in the blood isn't able to go through like it used to there's more pressure on there right so it starts backing up into that portal vein and starts to stretch it out and so you start getting portal hypertension because there's a lot of fluid in that vein that can't go forward through the liver does that make sense so now that you have portal hypertension now portal hypertension is going to cause all the rest of the problems right so esophageal varices right you're like okay what in the world does that have to do with the liver right well things just back up right and for some reason whatever blood vessel goes to your esophagus somehow gets impacted by that backup of fluid from the portal vein right so if the if the portal vein starts swelling and getting blown up and full of pressure it somehow backs up into those little vessels and blood vessels um, in your esophagus. So now if you were to like look at someone's esophagus, you'd see like these thick bulging, um, you know, blood vessels in your, in your throat, which is a problem, right? Because like you eat and you swallow like food that could possibly rupture those, those sensitive and now fragile vessels, right? So esophageal, bleeding esophageal varices is a, is a big problem. They're prone to rupture, and we'll talk about treatment of that in a little bit. Um, another complication of cirrhosis is coagulation defects, and we talked about this with the functions. If it's not producing the clotting factors, you're going to have bleeding issues. PT is going to go up. Platelets are going to be down. Jaundice, that's because of the unconjugated bilirubin. Ascites. Now, ascites, um, do you guys know what ascites is? Build up a fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Yeah. So why this happens is back to the portal vein. That blood in that fluid can't flow through fast enough, and so it starts backing up, right? And so now it's like putting all this extra pressure in that portal vein. And so the the like if these are the individual cells, they start to like separate a little bit because there there's so much pressure and fluid is leaking through the cells out of that portal vein into the abdomen right and so all that extra fluid is leaking out into the peritone peritoneal cavity and giving you ascites does it also have to do with like the lack of albumin mm -hmm. if your liver there is, is albumin awesome. in water you mm -hmm. know yeah so and we know that the liver um is making <laughs> the albumin and if the liver is not working then you're not making albumin and that's it just causes tons of problems albumin is like a, yeah, it's a really important molecule. Um, we talked about hepatic encephalopathy. And what's that from? The buildup of what? Ammonia. Right. We talked about, I think it's pretty much it. I mean, there's peritonitis, but I mean, that's, you know, obvious enough. If you have something leaking into your peritoneum and it gets an infection, you get peritonitis. Any other questions about, um, about complications or signs and symptoms of cirrhosis? It should make sense, right? Now that you know the functions really well, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll go straight to portal hypertension since that's a complication of cirrhosis, right? We talked about esophageal varices. We'll talk about that in a minute. You can also have dilated varices or dilated veins in your stomach and your rectum, kind of anywhere because it's just backing up. Um, what are some things that you can think of that might cause those esophageal varices to rupture and burst? Coughing. Yeah, so coughing really hard. So do we know any drugs that cause coughing? ACE inhibitors. Right, so maybe we don't want to put them on an ACE inhibitor, right? They might have hypertension. But we don't want to treat their hypertension with an ACE inhibitor because if they get that cough, then they could possibly rupture those varices, which would be bad. All right. Um, what else? What other cause? What else do you think could cause a ruptured varice? Trauma, like a yeah, car so accident, getting hit in the throat somehow. You know, <laughs> rupturing it because they're really fragile now. You know, like very stretched out vessels are weakened, right? They're not, they don't have the same elasticity and strength they used to. I mentioned eating hard foods, like roughage foods, um, 
have you guys ever choked on a Dorito that is literally the worst pain in your life? Like you swallow a chip and it like scrapes all the way down and like you feel like you're going to die. Like having an es esophageal varicity with that would probably not be the best. Um, I don't think that counts as a roughage food, but it's, it's, it's that's poking. happened to me before too, though. So. Oh God, it's Maybe too uncommon. <laughs> worse than stepping on a Lego. Um, what else? Strenuous exercise. And this, I imagine, would just be like, your 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 um you know when you exercise a lot like your blood is pumping really hard your heart rate goes up your blood pressure goes higher and it's like you're you're causing more and more like blood flow and pressure like and they'll probably just rupture um okay so with treating these esophageal esophageal varices um obviously maintaining airway is a big deal they have um uh, do they have that little picture of the um the ESO, esophag, let's see if I can say this, esophagogastric tamponade tube in your notes? No. They don't have that picture? Oh, that's sad. Okay, no. have, I have it in mine. So I don't know if it's gonna be good enough for you to see it or not. Um, can you see that? Oh, wait, let me see. I do see it. So basically what it is, is it's like a nasogastric tube. So, you know, you've got the, this is difficult. How do I do this? Okay. What is it uh, called again? Esophagogastric tamponade tube. Is it similar to the Sagan steak in Blakemore tube? Uh, I don't know that it could be a new model. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, is what this is, is it's a nasogastric tube going up the nose, down the throat, right? And then the esophageal varices are usually down lower. They're not like up here. They're like down towards the bottom of your esophagus. So then this like balloon right here gets inflated at the end of that nasogastric tube to kind of put pressure on those esophageal varices to like kind of squeeze some of that fluid out and keep them from bursting. But the nasogastric tube keeps going all the way through and it ends in the stomach right there. So this person, like they're getting fed, you know, like formula or whatever, you know, the, the tube feedings down the, down the tube. So it's just like a nasogastric tube, except it's got that like compressive uh, bubble balloon thing right there. Right. And then this little ball right there, is um, just another balloon that they inflate to keep it like this is going through the sphincter into the stomach. So it's like a Foley, it's like the Foley that, that you inflate the balloon to keep it in the bladder. So that balloon will like keep it lodged in the correct spot in the stomach so it doesn't like move up or down. Does that make sense? Yes. So that'll help kind of compress those, uh, those varices um, to keep them from bursting. Um, obviously, if someone's got one of these, you just, you know, checking placement, monitoring airway, um, that sort of thing. The other thing that um, if someone were to like have the bleeding, like they have a ruptured varicy and all of the blood is spilling into their stomach, that would cause a problem. I'm going to see if you guys can figure out why. What did we talk about with red blood cells earlier? What happens when they get destroyed? They cause bilirubin to go up. Right. So if you're digesting a lot of blood, right, that would obviously destroy the red blood cells if you're like digesting them right in your stomach. So the red blood cells would, you know, separate into their, their individual subunits and create more unconjugated bilirubin right? And your liver can't deal with it. It's like, we can't conjugate the bilirubin, right? Mm -hmm. So like digesting all this blood would be bad. So like, you definitely want to suction it out. Um, you know, they've got like, you know, the suction canisters, make sure that if they are bleeding, that it's getting suctioned out because you do not want to raise their bilirubin levels. Does that I make have sense? that written next to like lavage. Yeah, that's a People suction. Like to inject fluid and aspirate, getting rid of the blood that's sitting in the stomach. Because when you digest blood, your ammonia levels will also go up. I didn't know that about the ammonia, but it also does with the bilirubin. Okay. I can get her to clarify that for sure. But does that make sense? We don't want them to be yes. digesting that, that blood. For sure. 
Um, what else? Pretty much that. Um, it gets to be a lot more like manageable when you were like, okay, these are the functions. I get it. Um, like when it goes to the coagulation, bleeding, we don't even really need to talk about it too much because you already get why, right? So obviously you need to put them on some, you know, on bleeding precautions and, you know, help them with some vitamin K, which helps with clotting, right? So you know, kind of, you'd think about what nursing in interventions you would do for someone who has a bleeding risk. Jaundice, we already know, it's the yellowing of the skin, the eyes, the mucous membranes. Um, not just, this is directly from the bilirubin, but what, what else, uh, Tracy, I think you mentioned it, what's their stool gonna look like? Clay and pale. Yeah, because the bilirubin isn't gonna be there to color the stool. Um, so with nursing interventions for jaundice, um, you wanna avoid heat just because heat is a vasodilator. And so you're gonna be, the, your vessels are gonna be dilating and it's gonna send like more bilirubin into the bloodstream and it's gonna make you even more itchy. So cold showers are gonna be a lot better for these patients than hot showers. Um, just cause like, it's going to make them like matting, maddeningly itchy, um, keeping their nails short just so that they're not like scraping their skin off and causing like cuts in their own skin. Um, you can give them some antihistamines to help with the itching. So nothing crazy. We talked a little bit about ascites, why it happens. You know, the liver gets congested, causes fluid to back up and leak out, causing third spacing. Um, you can tell if someone's got ascites if it's really obvious, but you can also look for the fluid wave. Did you talk about that in class at all? Like on the abdomen, you can like, you know, put your hand and see the, the fluid wave on their belly. Mm -hmm. um, you can do an ultrasound if you really want to see how much fluid is there. Nursing care, how do we get rid of fluid? Diuretics. Yeah. Would you want to do potassium wasting or potassium sparing? Actually, I don't know if they talk about that. I was thinking, um, potassium sparing. Yeah, she wrote down both of them. Um, I was kind of wondering if it mattered which one. I'm not really sure. I would imagine that the electrolytes would probably be off. With... Their, their potassium would already be lower. Yeah. So um, I mean, it just would help them in general. I feel like. The good news is that as a nurse, you don't actually have to make that call. The doctor will, <laughs> but just knowing yeah. that diuretics are what they need. Um, you were gonna help. You're gonna limit their salt. Why you're gonna limit salt? Salt and water are besties. Right. So if where there's salt, there's fluid. So if you want to get rid of the fluid, don't give them salt because the salt is gonna make them hold on to the fluid. Right. Mm -hmm. um, salt causes like water to stay. Um, you're going to check their, you know, their electrolytes just because that fluid shift can cause weird electrolyte imbalances. Do a daily weight, um, you know, measure around their belly to see if it's getting better or worse. Common sense stuff, right? It's just really understanding why they're having the ascites. And once you kind of get that, the rest of it makes sense. Um, one of the things you can do is a paracentesis. Okay. So if the fluid's really bad and it's causing a lot of pressure, that can cause problems because you have a, like a lot of weight sitting on that abdomen. It's going to be putting all this weight on those organs inside and that can cause problems, right? It can be painful or it can like be so bad that it's like blocking circulation to those organs. Maybe it'd be hard to poop because you've got so much weight, right? So they can do a paracentesis, which is really just inserting like a needle into that peritoneal sac and like draining the fluid out, right? Um, so one of the things that you would have a patient do is make sure they go pee first, just so that their bladder is as shrunken and small as possible. So that when you stab them with the needle, it's not accidentally stabbing them in the bladder. Right. Um, so that's helpful. Um, obviously just watching their vitals as this happens, that they're not like going into shock or anything or like having hypovolemia, you know, if they're taking out too much fluid at a time. Typically, you know, they don't take out all the fluid all at once. They'll like take out some kind of weight for you to adjust and then take out some more. Um, it's pretty much that. Um, any questions about any of that so far? No. I'm a then, it, 
And then it talks about, you know, the, oh, here it is, the portal systemic encephalopathy. I knew it was an acronym, PSE. So that, again, is just the encephalopathy due to the ammonia. Um, I mean, you can, I don't really know what well, they would do about this exactly, but like they can, um, you can give them sedatives, you can give them analgesics to kind of like calm them down. Um, but other than that, you can't do too much without like getting rid of the ammonia. So I don't know if, I'm, I kind of wondered if like ammonia can be removed via dialysis, but that wasn't something that was ever answered for me, but that's just a question that I would have. Um, signs and symptoms of this encephalopathy, um, obviously going crazy, restlessness, short attention span, reduced level of consciousness, comatose. Another an interesting one is called asterixis, asterixis, I don't know how to pronounce it. And that's just, um, you know, like you have like these, like you have with your hands, you like, you lose the ability to like maintain flexion. So like an, a good example is like someone has really bad handwriting that like starts to get worse. And you'll see like a lot of liver, liver patients um, that have this like high ammonia levels, their handwriting will start to get bad because they're not able to like control those fine motor movements. Um, pretty much all, I mean, other treatments, um, you know, a lot of it's just monitoring. Like you can't do a ton. Um, you know, I mean, what does your guys have? It says that you can monitor you know, diet, monitor potassium levels. If you have to, you can give sedatives, anti-anxiety meds, but there's not too much else. Do you have anything, Sita? Um, administering lactulose is what she talked about a lot. Oh, here it is on the back side of the page. Here it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was like, I knew there was something in here and it was on the back side. Okay, yeah, it's the bowel cleansing. And oh, you'll see this all the time. Oh, Lord. Okay, lactulose. Have you guys ever had a patient on lact lactulose yet? I have not, but I've heard horror stories. Gosh, you, when you do, you will not forget. So lactulose basically just makes you go, like, all the time. <laughs> like, it says uh, soft stools two to four times a day. No, lactulose makes you have constant diarrhea. Don't let them lie to you. Like, it just empties you out, right? This bowel cleansing... <laughs> it's just something about the lactulose like will get absorbed through that intestine and it will bind to the, to the ammonia and you have it come out in the poop right so you know that your intestines like absorb everything right so if you put all that lactulose in there it like it will absorb the ammonia through the bloodstream and it'll come out in the poop so it'll help decrease their ammonia levels um yeah and it causes a lot you, they want to try and dose it so that they're not constantly having watery stools, but I have never in my life see them get it like at a good level where they're not having that. Um, the only thing that with the lactulose is that you have to make sure to monitor their glucose levels. Cause I don't know if you guys remember from nutrition, like there's several different types of glucose, right? There's sucrose, glucose, fructose, there's lactulose right? So lactulose is a type of sugar. So if they're like massive amounts of lactulose, like that can give them hyperglycemia, right? So some side effects of the, of the lactulose is cramping, obviously, diarrhea, obviously, dehydration, if they're like losing too much water in, the in their diarrhea, hyper hyperglycemia because of the sugar. So make sense? Yes. So does it affect your potassium level too? Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly like all this stuff. It's been a while since I've been in nursing school. My notes say it can cause hypokalemia and I'm just trying to remember why. Um, she told us in class, they, it lowers their potassium because they poop it out. It's like KX late. Okay. That makes sense. That works. <laughs> <laughs> I also think of like potassium with, you know, diabetics, like when your glucose gets really high, you know, and on the insulin and the, the mm -hmm. potassium shifts from the cell into the bloodstream and, you know, all that stuff. So I, I always link like sugar and potassium in my mind already anyways, just because of diabetics, like, you know, when they go into acidosis and things, the potassium kind of gets lost. So anyways, that's pretty much it. So the rest of it is just kind of like liver transplants, which is like, 
you know, any same as any other transplant. Um, not the rest of it is pretty much pretty standard unless you guys have any specific questions on on any of it. So regarding the PSE under like most common precipitating factors, we have excessive protein intake. You see if I have this somewhere. Uh, and like today, today we learned that they should use plant based proteins because they found that that doesn't rise the ammonia levels as quickly as eating meat. But remember, should it stop? Where does the ammonia come from in the first place? Do you remember? We talked about this in the beginning. The kidneys? The gut bacteria, the right? Sorry, what'd you say? The gut bacteria. Oh, yes. So the gut bacteria is breaking down the stuff that you eat um, and producing ammonia. And if you look back to the beginning where it says that converts ammonia to a urea under the functions, it'll say protein digestion by bacteria in the gut. So the more protein you're consuming, that bacteria in the gut is going to produce more ammonia. So a low protein diet would produce less ammonia to begin with. Okay. I get it. So protein digestion by the gut already. Yeah. That helps me understand that a lot better. Yep. No worries. Um, I Any have other questions? a question from the esophageal varices. Mm -hmm. um, she said something about like to maintain the airway and put the patient upright and turn to the side. Does it matter which side? Or? I don't think so. Um, just, you know, it's kind of like we know when someone's having seizures, you're going to turn them to the side in case they like have blood or vomit or whatever. Like it's not going to like get swallowed down their trachea. If they're like laying on their side, it will come out their mouth rather than going down, you know? So if someone's like, you know, people have died like vomiting and, sw and drowning in their own vomit, but if their like head was turned to the side, like it would drain outwards. So same thing with blood bleeding from the varices. Um, and also for the, um, the IV vasopressin, she said to also monitor the EKG and give nitroglycerin. Like, why do we give nitroglycerin? Where is that under? It's under um, the esophageal varices. Oh, it's on the other page. Say that, which question are you asking about again? It's under like reduced hepatic blood flow and to give vasopressin. Oh, okay, let me see. Um, oh yeah, okay, so vasopressin is gonna constrict, right? So in my notes, I have it says, that the vasopressin will help to constrict the GI system, which will help to like reduce the dilation of those varices. Okay. Um, nitro, I'm not really, the EKG is just because, um, you know, vasopressin can affect the heart as well. Like it's not going to just affect the GI system. The nitro, I'm not really sure about. Um, I guess they would have to, the nitro acts specifically on the heart muscle, you know, and it helps dilate the, the, the vessels in the, in the heart. So I guess if they're on a lot of vasopressin to, to, to constrict those GI vessels that they don't want the heart muscle vessels to like also be really constricted because you don't want to reduce blood flow to the heart. So I guess the nitro would help to dilate the vessels in the heart to kind of protect the heart from being constricted. Okay. That's what, that's what I get from that. So good questions, guys. Any others? Where did it talk about the GI, the flora? The GI flora in the very beginning where it talks about the, the liver uh, functions under converts ammonia to urea. It talks about how ammonia is a, a byproduct of protein breakdown, and that happens by the bacteria in your gut. So like when you eat food, if I eat a big turkey sandwich, you know, all the bacteria are going to be, you know, breaking down that turkey and it's going to produce more ammonia than if you were just like eating carrots or something. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any others? Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording.